Hello, students. Welcome back. Dr. D.A. here. In this activity, we're going to be studying calorimetry and the application of Hess's law. This is experiment number uh, 11 in your lab manual. So please have your uh, uh, lab manual pages with you, beginning on page 36. And let's talk about what the experiment is about, OK? Let's go here to our makeshift dock manager. And uh, let's see what this is going to be about. So we are interested in the reaction that represents the formation of a metal oxide. It's generic here, but what we're dealing with here is a metal from group two, like you know, magnesium, calcium, uh, those kind of elements, reacting with oxygen to form the oxide of the metal. Uh, this is balanced so as to yield one mole of the compound from its component elements in their standard states, which is why we sometimes have to use a fractional coefficient so that the coefficient on the product will be one. We are interested in finding out what is the enthalpy of this reaction, because since this is a formation reaction, that would be the standard enthalpy or heat of formation of the metal oxide. Now, if we try to do this in the lab, we'll encounter a couple of problems. Number one, the reaction is too exothermic. As a matter of fact, for magnesium, uh, the burning or combustion of magnesium essentially produces not only a lot of heat, but a very bright white light. That's what uh, photographers used in the old days to produce flash so they could take uh, pictures in the dark. It's also a difficult reaction to do uh, in the lab because it's not easy to handle oxygen gas to do a calorimetry experiment. And we don't have a bomb calorimeter to work with. So what we do in these cases is we're going to assemble a fictional reaction path. Uh, we're going to choose a set of reactions for which we either know or we can measure the delta H. And we're going to arrange them in such a way that when we add them up, we end, we re, the result is the reaction we're looking for. This is Hess's law, which basically says that the enthalpy of a reaction is the same regardless of how many steps it is done in. Or another way of saying it is that for a uh, chemical reaction, the enthalpy is not dependent on the path of the reaction or the steps that it takes or the mechanism that it takes. It just depends on the initial and final states. So we're going to do this to find delta H for this metal oxide. All right. If you look at page 36 of your lab manual, you'll find this page. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out these equations that are in here for us to explore them very quickly here, OK? So these are the four equations that we're talking about. And let's see what our strategy is. First of all, this equation number four, that is our target. That's the one we're trying to reach because that's the formation reaction for the metal oxide, all right, for which the enthalpy is the enthalpy of formation of the metal oxide. So when you try to apply Hess's law, what you do is you find a set of reactions that you can organize or arrange in a way that, just like in an algebra set of equations, the quantities or items you want to eliminate are on opposite sides of the uh, equation sign, in this case, the arrow, and you can cancel them out so that at the end you, you have the reaction you want. So first thing we look for is, do we have a reaction where the metal is already a reactant? That would be reaction one. So I'm just going to copy reaction number one over here. And that is the metal reacting with HCl aqueous, which is hydrochloric acid, to produce a chloride of the metal, dissolved in water, and hydrogen gas. And we're going to say that reaction has an enthalpy, delta H1. You might recognize that reaction as something we studied in class as a single or single replacement or single displacement reaction where the metal comes in, displaces hydrogen gas, and in the process goes from an oxidation state of zero to an oxidation state of plus two. So it's a redox reaction. Okay. The second equation here has the same, but it's for the metal oxide. 
However, we want the metal oxide to be a product in our target equation. So what we're gonna do is we can flip this reaction and the flip reaction number two would behave as if the metal chloride solution is reacting with water to give us the metal oxide and the HCl. As we learn in class, when you flip an equation, you also have to switch the sign on the delta H. So this now becomes minus delta H2. So whatever the enthalpy of this reaction is, we're going to use the negative of. The third equation is here just because it's a very well-known equation. This is the equation for the formation of water from its component elements, hydrogen and oxygen. And this will have a delta H3. And of course, as you see, it's already given, right? They gave us this value here already. So we'll incorporate later when we do our calculations, all right? So let's see what happens when I add up these three equations. Again, just like in regular algebra, anything that's on both sides of the equation can cancel out. So for example, the two units of HCl here will cancel out the two units of HCl over there. The metal chloride solution will cancel out with the metal chloride on the reactants side of the flipped equation number two. The hydrogen gas product of equation one can cancel out with the hydrogen gas reactant of equation three. And finally, the water in the reactants side of the flipped equation number two will cancel out with the water in the product side of equation three. Let's see what we're left with. We have the metal as a reactant. We have the oxygen as a reactant and we have the metal oxide as a product. So let's write out what the resulting equation is. So we have metal still standing, have a mole of oxygen gas still standing, and the metal oxide still standing. This is reaction number four, so it would have a delta H4. And as you can see, that is exactly what we were looking for. So essentially, when we add up these equations to give us the one that we want, we are assembling a fictional path. It doesn't mean the reaction happens that way, but it doesn't matter as long as we have the correct reactants and the correct product. So what we're going to do then is we're going to add up the enthalpies. So the total enthalpy of this process would be delta H1 minus delta H2 plus delta H3, right? This is going to be delta H4, which by definition is the heat of formation of our metal oxide, okay? Now, what about these values? Where do we get them? Well, H th delta H3 is the heat of formation of water, which is given to us. So we don't have to do that one. It's already given to us. The ones that we're interested in are the heats of the reactions of the metal with HCl and the metal oxide with HCl. So these are the ones that we are going to have to measure. And that is essentially the procedures for today. This is what our lab is about. How do we find the enthalpies of these reactions? To do that, we're going to use a calorimeter. And a calorimeter essentially can be made by putting together a styrofoam cup. Actually, we're going to use a double styrofoam cup to be sure. We're going to even put a lid to make it even better insulated. And realize that in this situation, everything inside the calorimeter essentially retains all the thermal energy that's in there. So if our system is essentially a reaction that is happening in an aqueous solution, that means that the surroundings to our system are the solution and, of course, the inside 
wall of the calorimeter. Now, we're not going to measure what happens in the reaction. We're going to put a thermometer here in the solution, and we're going to measure what is the uh, temperature change of the surroundings. That's what we're going to be measuring. Temperature change of the surroundings. All right. So what does it mean, for example, let's say that the temperature change in the surroundings in, uh, is positive. In other words, the temperature increases. Well, that means that the solution and calorimeter must have absorbed heat. Where did they come from? It must have come from our system. In other words, this would mean that we have a reaction that is exothermic. It put thermal energy out into the surroundings and therefore caused them to increase their temperature. What would happen if delta T of the surroundings is negative? In other words, the temperature uh, goes down. Well, that means that our system must have absorbed thermal energy from the surroundings, which means therefore that our system or the reaction is endothermic. Okay, so let's work on this now quantitatively. Remember, the coffee cup calorimeter is essentially what we call an isolated system. which means that all of the energy transactions are contained inside the calorimeter. Or as I sometimes say, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What is the total energy exchange that happens in here? All right. Well, it would be whatever heat the reaction uh, exchanges plus whatever heat the solution exchanges plus whatever heat the calorimeter itself exchanges. We have to include the calorimeter because the interior of the calorimeter is in contact with the solution and capable of exchanging thermal energy with it, right? Now, according to the law of conservation of energy, there should be no net change of energy inside here. This is because of conservation of energy, right? So that means that all of those energy exchanges add up to a net heat exchange of zero. So let's do this. Let's rearrange this expression so we can determine what is the actual heat of our reaction. Well, it would be minus the sum of the heat of the solution plus the heat of the calorimeter. And we have studied uh, equations to determine those, and uh, you'll recognize them. For example, for the solution, we're going to use the famous MCAT, I call it MCAT uh, equation. So the heat for the solution would be the mass of the solution times the specific heat of the solution times delta T of the solution. So it looks like MCAT, that's why I call it that way. For the calorimeter, what we would have is the heat capacity of the calorimeter. In other words, the calorimeter does not have a specific heat. It's not like per gram of calorimeter. It's per calorimeter times the temperature change in the calorimeter. All right. So the first part of our experiment consists in finding out what is this value? What is the heat capacity of the calorimeter? And we have to find that by calibrating it. So we have to calibrate the calorimeter, which means we need to find out how much energy does the uh, calorimeter exchange during a typical process, all right? So with these ideas in mind, what we're gonna do now is, uh, I would like for you to make sure that you go back to uh, our Canvas page, and in the next stage of the assignment, you're going to be watching a couple of videos by Dr. Mary Perot. She is going to demonstrate the techniques, the equipment, how to set things up properly for both the calibration and the chemical reactions we're going to study. And then how do we measure the temperature and determine the final temperature of our system? All right. So please go watch those videos and then we'll be back to go over some of the calculations in the experiment. Okay. I'll see you soon.